Welcome to the audio laboratory. In the last episode, we promised to show you another type of reverb, which is the convolution reverb. With a convolution reverb, you can take any signal and apply what's called an impulse response to it, IR for short. This allows you to mimic the sound of real spaces with the click of a button. Testing, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. But you're not limited to only reverbs. An impulse response can also contain loudspeaker and microphone combinations. Testing, one, two, three. Testing, testing, one, two, three. It's a dream come true for movie sound designers. A whole library of environments at your fingertips. And you can even create these impulse responses yourself. Has this ever happened to you? You're in a space with awesome acoustics and you think to yourself, Whoa, what an awesome sounding church. I wish I could play death metal in here. Well, now you can. First, we need to send a short burst of broadband acoustic energy into the room. Popular choices are a starter pistol, a balloon pop, or a hand clap. Make a clean recording of the resulting sound without any unwanted noises. This impulse response can now be loaded into a convolution reverb plugin, and we can apply it to any audio signal we want. Let's take a look at all of this in the Digital Audio Workstation. Let's add a convolution reverb to this track. Reverb is one that's included with Reaper, but of course there are plenty of other plugins available. Here we can add our impulse response file. Use the wet-dry controls to adjust the balance to your liking. Ideally, the signal you apply the IR to should be a dry recording without its own reverb, or else you'd be applying a reverb on top of a reverb, which might not be what you want. A clear disadvantage of impulse responses is that you can't change any of their fundamental parameters. Everything from the room acoustics to the microphone placement is baked into it. And the quality of an IR depends on all components that were used to record it. This includes the impulse itself. Starter pistols, balloon pops or hand claps are convenient, but they are not ideal impulses and they can impose their own character on an impulse response. If you want a more precise result, you can use a sign sweep such as this one. This contains a rising sign tone that covers a wide frequency range. Let's have a listen, but I'll turn down the volume first because it's a very annoying sound. So, unlike the other methods, you don't send all frequencies at the same time in a short burst, but over the course of a few seconds. You can play this on a loudspeaker inside of the place you want to capture. So, let's experiment and make our own impulse response. Instead of a room, we're going to capture the sound of this reverb pedal. We don't even need a speaker or a microphone. Output 4 of our audio interface goes straight into the input of the reverb pedal. The pedal's output goes back into the input 1 of our audio interface. Since this pedal is intended for guitars, switching the input of the audio interface from line level to instrument level gives us a slightly better signal-to-noise ratio. You could also use a DI box for the same purpose. Now that everything is set up, let's open up Reverb. When adding a file, instead of loading an impulse response, you can cancel and then generate a test tone. Use the same sampling rate as you're recording in, which in our case is 48k. In our experience, longer sweeps can result in a better frequency response. But for brevity's sake, we'll leave it at the default value of 4 seconds. The sign sweep is now saved as a file. Let's drag it onto a track. What we need to do now is send this sign sweep out to the pedal and record the resulting reverb. We don't need to hear the sign sweep on our speakers, so we'll remove it from the master out. Instead, we have to send it to hardware out 4, which goes into the spring reverb. The signal is processed by the pedal and returns into input 1, from which we will record it. Just a quick test to make sure everything is working. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Wonderful. Let's go. Be sure to let the reverb tail ring out completely before stopping the recording. This recording now carries the responses to all frequencies across time. 
but it's not a usable impulse response yet. We need to deconvolve it first. Inside of Reverb, press the Deconvolve button. This is where the magic happens. Reverb now needs our recording, the sine sweep we used, and it wants to know where to save the resulting impulse response. And that's it. The recording is now deconvolved into an impulse response. All the information is distilled into this file. It's not much more than a short pop, but if you listen closely, you can hear that classic spring reverb drip. The file doesn't contain any useful information after this point, so you can now trim it to a more sensible length with a fade out and render it as a new file. But make sure that you don't fade in, or else you will lose an important part of the impulse response. But for now, we can leave the file as it is. In fact, after deconvolving, it was already automatically loaded into Reverb. Amazing, isn't it? Instead of an impulse response, you can actually load any sound you want into the convolution reverb. For instance, this weird synthesized owl. This sure spices up any drum beat. Nowadays, impulse responses are very popular in guitar amp modeling, where they quite convincingly simulate different loudspeaker cabinets. But before you get your hopes up, impulse responses are only useful for linear systems. So, while they are very suitable for reverb and speaker cabinet simulations, they can't reproduce dynamic effects like distortion, compression, or modulation. That's it for this flashcard. Don't hesitate to leave a comment. And if you want to see more videos like this one, subscribe and ring the bell. Bye. <laughs>